Hi, Jeff here, Whiskey and your guide through this whiskey tasting course. Let me tell you a bit about myself. I live here in Dollar in Scotland, in the Central Belt, eight miles from 20 million barrels of maturing scotch at Diageo's Black Grange facility. I've been involved in whiskey, drinking it for 50 years. Um, I've been tasting seriously for the last 10. I am a blogger, a taster, a consultant, and a premium spirit advocate. I review whiskey from all parts of the world, but especially Scotland. I review cognac and armagnac, rum, bourbon, of course, and rye. I host tastings professionally, and I um, run the local whiskey club here in Dollar. This course is designed to help you get the most out of whiskey as a hobby, which in the future you might build on to become something that might earn an income. I'm going to guide you through eight lessons covering this introduction, our senses, because after all, it is between our nose and our mouth that we most accurately understand whiskey. We'll look at flavour from the ingredients, the basic ingredients, and what they contribute to the flavour profile. We'll look at flavour from the process, so the distillery equipment and the way the master distiller runs it derives a lot of the flavour content. We'll look at the cask influences, arguably the major influence on the flavour profile of a whisky. I'll teach you how to physically taste. Also, I'll give you a run through tasting equipment. And finally, a section on how to improve your tasting. Now, it's key to know why tasting is important. No other food or drink is as complex as whiskey. Scottish Whiskey Association has detected over 120 different aroma and flavour compounds in whiskey. You'll enjoy your whiskey a lot more by being able to understand much more about it and appreciate it more. You'll take longer to appreciate it, and given the price of whiskey these days, it's important to get the most out of every glass you drink. You'll enjoy a variety of different spirits, exactly the same techniques apply to all other spirits, and it's interesting to be able to compare new spirits with spirits you understand. You'll be able to identify more aromas and tastes, and finally you'll appreciate all food and drink more. So we should start by me giving you a definition of ABV, alcohol by volume. Now you'll see on every whiskey label, legally, what the ABV is. The most common on the standard blends and malts is 40% ABV. What that means is 40% is alcohol in the form of ethanol. The 60% remainder is distilled water. Now, previously, this was known as um, proof. Now, proof is a bit complicated because if you're in America, proof is two times the ABV. So a 40% ABV whiskey is 80% proof. In the UK, it's much more difficult because for some reason, the multiplier is 1.8 times. I won't even try and do the maths. Now, proof was previously tested by milking by mixing not milking by mixing the alcohol with gunpowder if it was overproof by that i mean over a hundred percent and you put a match to it it would bang because of the um, sodium nitrate solubility in the spirit so there we go abv very important in your whiskey drinking <laughs> now i'd like to look at why professional stays whiskey Along the road, as I told you, is Diageo's facility. And in the labs there, they have the master blenders and tasters. Now, they taste for a number of different reasons. The first is to check for the quality of the different malts that are being brought in from the different distilleries. And they actually taste at 20% ABV. Now, a 20% ABV, a 40% whiskey is 50-50, the whiskey and the water. 
And they do that because that is the level at which they can best ascertain the quality. Then, of course, it's there that they're assembling blends against a profile. So trying to put the different whisky together so that make the blend. Now, you may have imagined that a blend was just a formula. 20% of this, 10% of that, 40% of that. But it doesn't work like that at all because every cask, every ingredient is different every time. And therefore, they have to taste very carefully to get an exact match with what they're trying to do. You always want your blend tasting the same every time you buy a bottle of it, after all. Of course, the other thing they do along at Black Grange, or Menstrie rather, which must be really interesting, is when they have to choose special releases. I mean, a good example recently was the Game of Thrones releases that um, Diageo did. Well, the tasters there, the experts, had to go through hundreds of casks, if not thousands, to find the expressions they wanted to include in that edition. Also, of course, they have to monitor cast development over time as it changes to see how long it should age or whether it should be bottled or blended at that point. Now, how they, these blenders work is against whiskey profiles. This is what a whiskey profile might look like. This spider diagram on each point has the different one as 12 of the different flavor groups. So we get cereal, fruity, grassy, floral, and so on. And they're tasting for these. The spider diagram is, is scaled from zero right in the middle to 10 at the outside. And the red line shows the profile of a particular whiskey. So in this case, it's quite fruity, quite floral, quite sweet, a little bit grassy. There's a tiny note of cereal, a bit nutty, and nothing much else. And that's how they compare their whiskies. So moving on, you might say, well, why would I need to know the flavours and tastes? I can just read what's on the package. Well, there's a bit of a problem with the package tasting notes. Package notes start with a distiller. The, dis the master distiller is best placed to judge exactly what the aromas and flavours are of his whisky. However, the marketing department edits these in order to get them to um, match with what they're selling. Although, in all honesty, there's a, an ongoing conversation these days between marketing and the distilleries, so that the distillery is producing flavours and aromas of whiskies they believe they can sell. But I have read quite often the package notes talking about maritime influences because it's always nice to paint the picture of the distillery and the warehouse by the sea with a salt air blowing through it. Unfortunately, large amounts of that particular whiskey I'm thinking about are matured inland miles from the sea. The other thing is if the master distiller has said he notes a phenolic note, maybe kippers with a hint of cheese, that doesn't necessarily fit the marketing speak. Who'd rather talk about Highland Glens and Heather. So they're not entirely reliable, these um, package notes, for these reasons. And indeed, I've found them often at least to disagree with my palate. To understand where all this comes from, you need to understand what the regulations are. The Scotch regulations, simplified, are fairly straightforward. All Scotch whisky must be matured in oak for a minimum of three years and it must be sold at a minimum of 40% ABV. It must be distilled and bottled in Scotland. I'll tell you a funny story about that. I, I had a, an acquaintance, well, a friend, who sold a cask of very old Macallan to the Chinese for a lot of money. Now, the only thing is, when that cask reached China, if the Chinese then bottled it in China, it would no longer legally qualify at Scots whisky. I don't suppose they were that bothered. Now, next regulation, if an age is shown on the label, then every component, every malt and the grain must be that age or more. And quite often you get a little bit more, a little bit older of one or two of the items in the blend just to raise the quality of it. Nothing except water and a small amount of colouring can be added. Finishing is allowed. So for the last nine months, 
of Wesky's life, it might be put in a different cask, maybe a red wine cask, a port cask, or even a virgin oak cask. Some of these casks can be quite lively and really lift the whiskey. There we go. The rules of bourbon, interesting to con contrast, are dif different. Obviously, have to be made. It must be made in the USA again in oak barrels, but they must be new barrels and charred. It is very unusual to find new barrels in Scots whisky. It's almost all ex bourbon casks or ex sherry casks, so they've been previously used for something else. Two years minimum for bourbon, mainly because in the temperatures in Kentucky, for example, in the rack houses, it matures much quicker, and um, in the case of bourbon, it has to be 51% corn. In the case of rye, 51% rye. It must enter the barrel at no less than 125 proof, so 62.5% ABV, which interesting is about exactly the same mark as Scotch whisky would aim for, although there is no such regulation in Scotland. Nothing can be added to a bourbon except water. And the mash bill can include corn, rye, and malted barley, some lovely American malts. Anyway, that's the end of lesson one, a short lesson. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you for your attention. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you for your attention.